Welcome. You're tuned into Life is a Sacred Journey. Every week, we bring a new perspective to aging and caregiving. Here is your host, Michelle Pope. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you out there in our virtual neighborhood of Life is a Sacred Journey. I welcome you all this morning and to my Facebook Live family. We took uh, some time off last week and had a rerun of our Vault interview so that you could learn a little bit more about Vault. It's just so good to be back here with you. My name is Michelle Pope, and you have joined us for another uh, gathering of Life is a Sacred Journey. I want to, again, say Happy New Year. This has been an incredible week of turmoil, chaos, and just a bunch of stuff. Very concerned about our world today. I got this, uh, my son gave me a Fitbit a couple of Christmases ago, and I finally got it back out and fixed it up and everything. And I realized this week, I have not gone into deep sleep after Wednesday at all. I've stayed in REM or light sleep, which means I'm dreaming, or I'm uh, super vigilant for all the reasons that I'm not gonna go into this morning because I've had enough of it. But I just wanna say good morning to all of you and know that we are going through some difficult times. So hit the share button. I know it's a foggy, cold, uh, crisp morning here in California. I wanna uh, send a shout out to Felicia thanking her again for her tremendous work in 2020 and looking forward to our partnership in 2021. Thanking all of the guests that uh, were with us and those that will be joining us in 2021 and to all of you uh, uh, for continually coming back and supporting Life is a Sacred Journey. So hit the share button. Oh, I have to tell you one thing. I'm really excited about this. So What we're going to be doing in February, I think it's going to take us a couple of weeks to pull this all together, is Life is a Sacred Journey was started here at Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay by a group of interns with me a long time ago, eight years ago, something like that. It was a blog on Blog Talk Radio, and it was an hour, and it was Friday nights at six o'clock. And so it was just a very different audience. Over, the, over this time and with Felicia's support, we have now gone to Facebook Live. We realize that this platform is wonderful and great, and we will continue to have this platform. But in order for some of the things that I want to say, as well as I'm hearing from you that you want to hear, I can't use Life is a Sacred Journey here for that. And that's because of it being affiliated with Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay and Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay is, you know, we have to, we, I have to keep that separate. They're not me. While I am the CEO, I do work for the organization. So that said, we are going to go to YouTube and we are going to begin having, we're putting together a new website that's for just for me specifically and for Life is a Sacred Journey. And we're gonna to go to YouTube and do the same thing. We're looking at platforms where we can do them at the same time, but we're, we're, we're gonna to wanna to be able, I, like last night I, I had so much on my mind that I wish I had a platform to go and do it. And so YouTube will provide that as well as monetize um, and bring uh, some donations and things to ASAP. So I just wanted to let you know that's kind of on the horizon and what we're thinking about doing. Uh, Please hit that share button. I'm not sure because sometimes what happens is this thing gets caught in private and then I, I don't get out to everybody. So hit the share button have a share party, uh, get it out, uh, and let people know that Life is a Sacred Journey is live in 2021. So I decided today to talk about compassion fatigue. And And it's because I am experiencing some of that myself right now. But before I do that, one of the things that that I try very hard to, to do is to separate some things that I know might offend and la la la. But this morning, 
I want to take a moment of silence. And I've, I, ha I always have a candle lit in my office anyway, more than one. But I lit a candle this morning for those individuals that got caught up and lost their lives on Wednesday, to all the people who have lost their lives to COVID-19, their family members who are experiencing grief and going into 2021 still feeling so much pain, to all the Black lives that were lost, not just in 2020, but for centuries and since the Middle Passage, to all the elders that are somewhere forgotten to let them know they're not forgotten, to all the unsheltered people who are invisible to us because we've gotten used to seeing tents in our, on our streets and we're not supposed to have tents on our streets. They're, we're supposed to use those for camping. Light a candle and I'm gonna just be quiet for a minute for all those things and anything else that you just want to lift up in your heart. And may justice come to our world soon. And may we come together as a humanity soon, <laughs> soon. Light your candle, take time today. We're still in shelter in place, so take a moment. You know, and as I told a group of folks last night at a prayer vigil uh, held by the uh, Cal Nevada Conference, young adults and their older generational friends, turn the TV off. Gosh. Take, take today, make a commitment to turn the television off, turn the radio off. We all, there's some good music out there. There's plenty of meditational music and sounds uh, that you can use on YouTube. Turn that on in your house. Open the windows of your home. Let that sound just go through your home. Let fresh air come in. Turn and don't look at social media, okay? For about an hour today, make that commitment to your health, to your well-being, to who you are as a human being. Turn it off so that something more wonderful like calm can be a part of your existence today. So that's my, my challenge to you. And I lift you up as you struggle with that because I do know that television and, and media and news and all that is just as much of addiction as this coffee that I have to have every single morning, okay? So I know that, but let's, let's get better at it. And, and for a healthy spirit, healthy mind, we have to separate from, from the chaos. Let's get started with compassion fatigue. Again, happy new year. You have joined Life is a Sacred Journey. We welcome you here today, and we are going to be talking about compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is this whole concept that those of us that have been working in the medical field, we talk about it a lot and we get trained on it a lot because just being uh, here at ASEB, actually, what's today? Oh, yesterday. Oh my gosh. Yesterday was the beginning of my 24th year here at Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay. Yay! Um, but in those 24 years, not only have I cared for and fallen in love with so many elders and, and individuals living with dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss, and mental health challenges, that I am always grieving the loss of somebody. I just realized, I think even in my church family, was it 20 people have passed away? I mean, you, you, I'm constantly, and, and the older I'm getting, I'm grieving more often and moving from one grief to the other. That's when compassion fatigue flips in. It flips in when you're feeling a sense of uh, helplessness, uh, when you can't do anything about uh, in the medical field. I can't cure this person. This person, when I was in hospice, uh, is going to die. No amount of prayer, no amount of medical intervention is going to stop that from happening. Compassion fatigue can sometimes get in there and get in, get in the way of healing and, and feeling whole 
and it makes you so tired. And that's why when I looked at my Fitbit sleep thing for uh, this week, I just looked at it this morning and realized from Wednesday on, I have not gone into deep sleep. I, last night, I only had an hour of deep sleep. Everything else was REM. Everything else was light sleep, which is not, you don't really get rest unless, unless you're in that deep sleep mode. And so the reality is we're living in a time of so much chaos and so much stuff coming at us. And I don't even watch television. And I still know. And I'm being bombarded because I look at YouTube and I read the newspaper and I listen to the radio in the car and, you know, all that stuff. So we're constantly being bombarded. Today, I drove in this morning to the office and kept the radio off. It was wonderful. It was dark outside still and the sun was ba basically coming up and it was really foggy after I got to Lafayette area, but it was magnificent. And, that, and it gave me an opportunity to to kind of connect with myself, to, to connect with, you know, my higher power and just be quiet. Oh my God, <laughs> just be quiet. And it was great. I even forgot to drink my coffee. So I had to, I had to heat it here when I got here. So do that for your soul. It's so important. Compassion fatigue is not burnout because burnout, you can say, okay, I am so burnt out like the Friday, the Thursday before New Year's. I, I worked the whole time and I thought, I am so burnt out, I'm done. And so right at noon, I got up, put everything in my briefcase. Uh, do they still call them briefcase? I always age myself with my terminology, my tote, and walked right out of the building and went home and actually went to bed and slept through a meeting that I was supposed to attend. It was a, an ad council meeting. So, you know, on a Tuesday rather. And so, you know, those were the kinds of things that you got to do for burnout. But compassion fatigue is like a stair step and it builds on anything and everything that pulls at your empathy and sympathy and something, a place of where I can't do anything about this. What can I do? And 2020 has been a year where compassion fatigue, I think is being felt by many, but we're not talking about it enough to let people know that it is normal for you to feel what you're feeling right now with everything that we've had to deal with as a humanity and process as a humanity. And have you been speechless in these moments? I know I've been, I've, I've had moments where I've just gone, people have said to me, Michelle, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't know what I think anymore. I, 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 I'm speechless. And so what does that mean? That, that means there's stuff going on inside where I can't even articulate the emotions that I'm feeling. And so that leads to compassion fatigue. I believe we're all experiencing compassion fatigue. So compassion fatigue is a cumulative. So it's on top, on top, on top, on top, cumulative effect of stress, loss, grief, pain. You know, I would beg to say that if it goes untreated or unchecked, it could lead to PTSD. I don't know that. I'm going to look that up <laughs> after this. But I would beg to say that it might because living in a compassion fatigue state leads to what happened, has happened to me in the last three days where we're not getting any sleep. So how long can a human go without enough sleep, without enough moments of joy? And it's different for all of us, right? It's different for all of us. And what, what happens when we stay in that place of compassion fatigue, our immune system go, is affected. So then we're more vulnerable to COVID and flu and cold and, and, and just illness. So you see the flip side our spirit, our mind, we just get so overwhelmed. We don't want to be engaged. We don't want to intersect with anyone. We get depressed. Okay. So compassion fatigue leads to all these other things, depression, anxiety, all these other things that separate us from not only ourselves, but from everyone around us. 
So I'm going to talk about the, some of the things that we can do to uh, really help with compassion fatigue. I want to lift up a company that I just became aware of from Felicia, actually. Thank you, Felicia. It's called Yellow Box Project. The Yellow Box Project came with this candle, the candle that I, I showed you originally, some lollipops uh, that not made of sugar but uh, or corn syrup or anything like that. They were uh, vegan, which I was very happy because I ate them both. And... Uh, affirmation card that is on my um, mirror and this incredible one minute journal. It has a, and you can do this yourself. You don't have to go get the box. I'm just showing it to you because Felicia was thinking about me and sent it to me and it made me um, think about the topic of this show um, or this broadcast. So you can go, you can order this from Amazon. It'll probably cost 10 cents and it's a one, uh, a one minute timer. And then, so I'm going to put the one minute timer. And then inside of it, it has for every page, you put a date and the amount of time, hopefully one minute, that it took you to write down your response. And, you, and again, so this is keeping you from going deep and all intellectual and just touching that place of your brain that's spontaneous and where um, joy lives in spontaneity. It says here, list your favorite teams. Okay, this says list your favorite cities. I might get stuck here. One minute might not be enough because I have so many favorite cities. I, I was blessed before COVID to be able to travel a great deal. It says describe a Hollywood or New York moment. Betty, I don't know if you're with us this morning, but you could do both, right? We could do a Hollywood and a New York moment, but you could do your own journal. And I'm sure there's stuff out there like this that you could get from Somebody told me about a book link and I'll have to look for it that's cheaper than buying books on, on Amazon and places, but I still buy stuff from Amazon because it's just convenient. But a one minute journal. And as I said to you, we said, or we said to you, a gratitude journal, starting something that gets your mind focused on the good, on the wonderful, on the magnificent, on the joy, on the... I'm still here kind of stuff. Like that's what I thought of this morning. I was looking in the mirror and because I haven't had a whole lot of great sleep, you know, I'm kind of like got bags under my eyes and stuff. I was looking at myself and I said, oh, girlfriend, stop it. You're still here. At the end of the day, we got to stop ourselves from that voice. I was sitting with a group of people on Zoom and we were having a conversation and I'm very sensitive now to language. I mean, I always have been, but I'm even more so now, more so, more so, more so. And I realize people don't listen, right? People don't listen and that they don't understand the words they're using. I realize that now because I'm listening more and being more, more, more intentional and leaning in. And it's not their fault because we misuse the language so much including myself. I'm, I, I'm, I actually brought my dictionary and thesaurus back out of the bookcase and I'm starting to look at words again. And one time I read the dictionary all the way through and I'm thinking I might use 2021 to do that again, just to reacquaint myself with the words as well as the pronunciations of them. Because if anybody knows me, I pronounce words terribly. <laughs> okay, I got so many accents thrown in that I, I pronounce words really terribly. But I think we need to learn what these words mean because words are being thrown at us and they appear to say one thing, but I'm not sure that's what, what the message is that, we're, that people are trying to inflict upon us. And, and I said the word inflict and I meant it that way. So let's, let's get more acquainted with the words that we're using. And compassion fatigue comes from that, comes from being around all of that negativity, words, actions, ugh, that kind of stuff. And so how do we get out of that? What are the things that we have to do in order to? So we could have a one minute journal. We could purchase one. We could do one on our own where um, we just come up with one minute. We, we say, okay, I'm going to uh, write down stuff that gives me joy. Okay. You can buy these wonderful bracelets that you can put lavender oil. That's what these are. 
They smell like lavender oil. So anytime I get stressed out, I, I smell them. That's why when you see me do that, I'm, I'm not picking my nose. I'm actually um, doing aromatherapy to get myself just like, and I can't put enough on them to make them go like really big. So I don't have to put it up to my nose <laughs> because um, I have allergies. And women used to do that back in the day, the handkerchief. Uh, when And even men would have it, especially in, in Paris, and they would put it here and it had perfume on it. And they would lift because it's, it smelled so bad because of the human sewage on the street. So there's things that we can do and we got to stop being in judgment of each other because sometimes people are doing things that might help them. Like I started laughing out loud the other day in CVS. I don't know why. I, well, I do know why. I saw a little kid, the cutest little kid. And its mother was busy doing, um, you know, trying to look at, I think, ingredients on something. And the little child uh, spotted the, the Christmas uh, ornament, like Christmas is over ornament sale box display. And that child was pulling from the mother. Mother was holding tight though. Uh, congratulations, mom, he did, the, he, this child didn't get away. But the look on their face was like, Christmas is still here and I wanna go grab me a piece of it. That's what we gotta do. Christmas is still here and how do we grab a little piece of it? Or my birthday is still here. How do I grab a little piece of that joy? Or a joyful moment in your life is still here and how do I rekindle that moment inside of myself? How do I visualize that? Meditation, I will tell you, meditation has saved my life um, because I cannot turn my head off. I try. Even in meditation, I'm talking to myself. I can hear myself talking to myself. And I've been, recently, I've gotten really good after sitting for darn near 30 minutes, finally quieting my head, but I'm talking still in my head. So how do we meditate and get quiet so that we can calm? And what are we doing when we do that? We're cultivating our own self-compassion, okay? Our own self-compassion. There's a psychologist, uh, her name is Kristen Neff, and she says that self-compassion is the act of kindness towards self, which entails being gentle to yourself, supportive of yourself, understanding of yourself. Rather than harshly judging yourself for your personal shortcomings, the self is offered warmth and unconditional acceptance. In other words, be kind to ourselves in good times and bad, in sickness and in health, and even when we make mistakes. Sounds like we're, we're marrying ourselves, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I have to tell you, I wasn't gonna tell you, but I'm gonna tell you because the spirit is moving me. There was a time in my life where my self-esteem was so bad <laughs> to the point where I won't say that I hated myself, but there were things that I was doing that were not a person that loved themselves. You wouldn't do it to yourself if you loved yourself, okay? Getting to a place of loving myself was so hard because as a child, I had eczema and I had it badly. Oh my gosh, it was all over my neck, all over the back of my neck, the, my hands, in the crevices of my arms, my legs, my face, uh, uh, my, my uh, senior class picture. I have eczema all over my face and because of the way that it would darken. It would leave dark marks on my skin. I got teased. I got teased and I got called crocodile girl and snake girl and <laughs> all these things. So I became a rebel and I became a fighter because of that, because of the bullying. So bullying is not new to the millennials and anybody. Bullying is a part of the human condition. We saw that, we see that every day, okay? but it really jacked up my self-esteem. But I had a love for fashion. 
my love for fashion because I turned all of that in and I'm a very creative person. I love artsy things and sculpting and painting and, and but fashion was where I really fell in love and really focused there. And so I was able to find beauty outside of myself in the fashion industry. And then I got turned on to nature and I started to find the beauty in nature. And then my spiritual journey began to grow and I began to find the love in myself. My faith journey brought me to a place where I knew I was loved and it didn't matter if um, humanity loved me at all. Mother, father, sister, brother, didn't matter, even though they do love me. <laughs> But it didn't really matter that the love that I was feeling from my faith journey was going to be more important and have to get me through. And then I started loving myself to the point where one day I looked in the mirror and I didn't see the little painful girl that cried. I'm even friends with some of the people on Facebook that made fun of me when I was a kid. Believe it or not, I don't know if they remember, but I certainly do. But forgiveness is also, who helps you with compassion fatigue. Because when you for can forgive yourself for what you cannot do, and when you can forgive yourself for what you're not responsible for, you can move into a better place of acceptance of yourself and then of others. There are people who write vile things. I had a, people wrote vile things to me on Facebook yesterday. I have this incredible ball, you guys. This is, a, I'm gonna go sidebar for a minute. Everybody, uh, uh, 2019, I think, I started having major sciatic back problems, blah, blah, blah. This tiny little ball <laughs> allows me to sit longer than I should be sitting, but allows me to sit. And isn't this amazing? It's just a tiny little therapeutic ball. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. So if you have sciatic problems, get one and, and, and it'll tell you where to place it and you can place it where it best uh, gives you a uh, relief. But that's just amazing. And I think it costs me like 9.99 or 20 bucks. I don't even know, it doesn't matter. It just gives me such relief and it's an amazing tiny little thing. And that's the same thing about life. Life can give you relief in the tiny places, the tiny moments. In one minute, life can give you relief. But you have to choose it. You have to choose it. It's not going to come knocking on your door and saying, I'm out here. I'm out here. I'm joy. Open the door. No. Or I'm happiness. Open the door. No. I am uh, self-love, open the door. No, you got to do your work. It's just like with everything with Black Lives Matter, we're going to have to do our work. And until we get serious about it and start crying and falling into each other's tears and wiping each other's tears and seeing each other's pain without saying, I didn't do it, will we grow? And we got to stop making excuses for our behavior. Like when I said on Facebook, I think I said on yesterday, yesterday yeah, it was yesterday or third, it doesn't matter what day, but I said it. And I said, we need to be mindful of how we got to this time in our history. We need to be mindful about how what we object to happened. And we need to talk about it so we don't repeat it. And over 76 people went in on me and said, it doesn't matter anymore. We're getting what we want, uh, that this will soon be over. Really? And I understand what people are saying. We don't wanna talk about that stuff. Oh, we, we voted them out. We did this, we did that. But we've got to talk about the mistakes that we make and figure out why we made them and shift the paradigm so we do not make them again, or we will repeat them. 
I was a smoker and I quit four times before I stopped smoking. Shout out to all of you who are still struggling with that. I didn't want to smoke. There came a point where the asthma and the smoking just didn't marry well together. But my desire to do it overrode it, even though intellectually I knew it was wrong. It wasn't until I married my, my mind and my heart and I said, Michelle, come on, girlfriend. You know you need to not do this. You need to help yourself better. Sticky post-it notes on the, <laughs> on the mirror in the bathroom, like, do not go and buy cigarettes. Do not smoke a cigarette. When you get stressed out, breathe. Because that was my whole modus operandi. I mean, this and a cigarette, oh my goodness gracious. It's the best thing in the whole wide world to me, to me, okay? And I fight it all the time. I still do. Trust me, Wednesday night, man, oh man, oh man, oh man, <laughs> I wanted a cigarette. Yeah, but instead I meditated and didn't get any sleep, but yeah, it's all good. So we gotta, we gotta be intentional about the change. So why is self-compassion so important to you? You got to treat yourself again as you would a small child. Stop treating yourself with your PhD and your master's degree and your bachelor's degree and all the stuff that you've accomplished in your life. Treat yourself gently as you would a child. And if you wouldn't say it to a child, don't say it to yourself. Particularly if you, you understand the fragility of the emotional uh, place of a child. You have that same fragility. So treat yourself as a small child. Give yourself permission to be imperfect. I always say to people, every time I make a mistake, I go, thank God. <laughs> Thank God I made a mistake because I don't want my ego ever to get so large that I think that I can't make a mistake and that everything that I do is so perfect and so wonderful and so great and such a gift. I want it to be mindful of I'm, I'm imperfect and so it's okay and I'm going to make mistakes. And I think sometimes like, you should make a mistake on purpose but not bad mistakes that hurt other people, like a mistake like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something. I'll think of something. <laughs> I'll write it in the chat. But a mistake that's not dangerous or bad or whatever, or sp misspell a word. There you go. Misspell a word. And it, it goes through and everybody sees it and they go, mm, she didn't use her spell check. So what? You know what I meant. You know, sometimes make a mistake. It's all good. Practice mindfulness. And we talked about that a lot. Remember that you're not alone. You know, there are people around you that love you and care for you. And that was one of my biggest mistakes in my 30s and 40s, because I came out of a place of anger and self-hatred in my 20s that I didn't trust people. And so I didn't share anything with any surface stuff surface stuff, but I mean, emotional feelings and la la la. I mean, I got a divorce and people didn't even know. Okay. So, 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 so the, but there are people out there who want to love you and let, and allow you to lean on them, fall on them, <laughs> brace your fall, all of that. And if you don't tell them and you don't reach out, they'll never know. So know that you're not alone. Know there's at least one person in your life that loves you more than you know and will be there in, in the silence and in the pain and in everything else. And for me, I also have my faith and I know many of you do as well, but there's always a person that loves you enough to walk with you. Work with a supportive therapist or a coach. And I'm gonna tell you why. That was something else that I had to do to get better. Um, and a lot of people don't, don't, don't think about it, uh, particularly people of color. Uh, we we ha are not understanding that we're living with PTSD from our um, mass incarceration uh, here in this country. 
um, and from uh, slavery and from everything that goes on around us. And as women, there are women out there who are living with the, not just uh, that if they happen to be women of color, but sexual harassment, sexual abuse. There, it happens to men as well. And we live through these things and we go through these things and we think we're okay. But we need help so we don't carry it all the way into our lives because there comes a time in life and I'm in that season of my life where I want to live my best, 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 bestest. There's the child in me. My bestest, most marvelous self. I want to feel what that feels like. I want to see what it looks like in the eyes of other people when I'm doing my best, like to be in connection with them. I can see it in the eyes of other people. And that gives me so much joy. So, but I went to a therapist after I realized I had tapes that were playing that were scarring and getting in the way of my spiritual success and my spiritual growth and my ability to love myself. And it was the best thing that I did. I had to find the right one. That was a pain in the neck um, because, the, yeah, anyway, I had to find the right one uh, because I didn't need a therapist to talk to me about, um, keep asking me about childhood trauma because I didn't have the kind of childhood trauma that that person was looking for. I needed them to understand the whole trajectory of growing up a black child in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, well, I wasn't a child by then, but, but yeah, in the 50s and 60s and the things that I heard and the things that I saw around me affected me deeply. And then being bullied with the, the eczema and all that drama added a whole nother set of stuff. And then there's a few little things that, that I needed support with. So get, co get coaching, get counseling. And you don't have to tell anybody if, if it's something that you want to be private about. I'm just sharing it with you because um, life is a sacred journey is about um, helping other people. Um, and I'm not telling you everything about my life. Don't get it twisted because you'll never know it all. But at the end of the day, there are things that I have done and, and, and adopted in my life that when you say to me, Michelle, um, how, how do you get over this? Or Michelle, you know, how did you become the person that you are? That, that's what I'm sharing with you. And I'm sharing that humbly with you, honestly, candidly, and from the heart. So we've talked about compassion fatigue today. We've talked about a lot of things today. Um, but what I want to say to you before I leave you today and you go into the rest of your morning, this happy, hopefully happier Friday for all of you, remind you, take time for self. Take time to know that life is really a very sacred journey. And no matter how old you are, it could end at any moment. And if you live it that way, not in fear, but live it in the moment like, what would I wanna do if I actually knew in the next hour I was gonna die? Who would I need to call and say, I love you? Or, you know, I need to ask for you forgiveness. Then just go do it. Get all that stuff off your back because it's weighing us down. And, it, and it's keeping us from our inner peace. So I want to thank you for coming to Life is a Sacred Journey. Please share this with whomever you think uh, should be a part of our Life is a Sacred Journey virtual family. We come to you every Friday morning at 8 a.m. I know it's early and sometimes it's hard for people to join us live, but we're making sure we have mechanisms so you can join us later in your day. And <laughs> there's so much on my heart I wanna say, but I'm not ready. And so I'm just gonna keep it in silence. And so, we're gonna end the, the broadcast this morning 
um, in silence. And so have a wonderful day. Take care of yourself. Love yourself. Wear your mask. Wear your hand sanitizer. Talk to your doctor about the vaccine. Um, I'll get more information to you in the next couple of weeks about that. And oh, take a deep breath. and have the best day that you can possibly have because you deserve it. Peace.